Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this uh, history festival. Um, so I'm going to talk about Stalin's Russia today. I'm going to talk about uh, the development of the system that uh, emerged as the Communist Party uh, consolidated its power after the, the revolution in 1917. And I'll give an overview of the enormous changes that take place in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. Now, this was a time when uh, the country seemed to be moving towards establishing some kind of new civilization. And this civilization was based on the ideas of the, uh, the Communist Party, of Marx, of Lenin. Uh, it was becoming a huge industrial power. It was the powers in the hands of the workers, uh, the industrial proletariat, uh, and the Soviet Union would become a nuclear superpower uh, in the 1940s. That's the, the, the party propaganda, really, that uh, image of communist power or the image of, uh, of workers' power, of the proletariat marching confidently towards the construction of socialism. What we have re in reality was uh, Stalin consolidating his own power within the Communist Party uh, and then throughout the Soviet Union uh, more widely in the 1930s, we have the, his power consolidated through the purges and the terror. So for many people in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, I think two words sum up Stalinism, hope and fear. Hope that socialism was being constructed, that some kind of new civilization was being constructed, was being built, and fear of the con consequences when people realized that that was not the case. So there are two things I want to uh, look at here. Firstly, the economic reconstruction of the USSR in the 1930s, uh, Stalin's so-called revolution from above, and then some of the means of control, particularly propaganda and terror. First, we need to be clear on what it was that the Communist Party was trying to achieve in the 1930s. Now, in theory, it was building an egalitarian society that it was uh, forging a democratic political structure, socialism and the socialist economic basis uh, that was establishing workers' control. Uh, the peasants were being brought along uh, in this uh, utopian vision of the future. And the ideas of Marx, of Engels and of Lenin were used to justify what the party was doing. And it's very important to note here that there was a sense of modernity that uh, embraced the USSR. Uh, it looked like the government of the day was following Lenin's ideas, uh, where we have this promise of electrification, modernity and the electrification of the country. So we have these propaganda posters here. Soviets and, the electri and electrification are the basis of the new world. Communism is Soviet power plus the electrification of the whole country. So there's this promise to build a modern socialist society. And this was especially timely in the 1930s, given what it looked like the collapse of capitalism in the West after the Wall Street crash and the onset of the Great Depression and the huge amount of suffering that that brought to millions of people across the Western world. However, while the Soviet Union became a new industrial power, Stalin created a vicious dictatorship uh, with only the pretensions of democracy, the only the pretensions of Soviet power itself. Stalin was the general secretary of the Communist Party. He was surrounded by his loyal lieutenants, as we can see here. So Stalin is in the middle uh, and we have uh, John Ikidze, Voroshilov, Kubyshev on his right and Kalinin, Kaganovich and Kirov on his left. Uh, these loyal party members, loyal to Stalin himself. And I think there's a, also there's a, a religious aspect to this uh, to this picture, because it reminds the comrades that Lenin here in this bus behind everyone, Lenin is always with us. So there is this sort of following on of building on Lenin's uh, promise uh, and Stalin used Lenin in that kind of semi-religious way. So Stalin and the Communist Party established a nationalist conservative Soviet Union with a state-owned economy, uh, with centralised control from Moscow, but there was no input from the workers or the peasants. So there's no sense of democracy, of no genuine democracy. And socialism and democracy have to go hand in hand. If a country claims to be socialist, but there's no way of democratically removing a government, uh, then there is a real question, a question mark over the socialist credentials of that country. 
There is mass upheaval in the countryside as well. The peasants were forcibly collectivised. So there's little evidence of uh, the socialism as outlined by Marx and Engels and Lenin being constructed here. And there was also the glorification of, uh, of Stalin through a cult of Stalin uh, that developed throughout the 1930s. Everything that was good was associated with Stalin. All the problems were the fault of wreckers or saboteurs. And wreckers and saboteurs was part of this new vocabulary, this new language of the 1930s dictatorships. So by the end of the 1930s, the Soviet Union had established a highly uh, industrialized modern system that was strong enough to fight off to uh, fight off the invasion of the Nazis after 1941 to defeat fascism not only in in the Soviet Union but to make an enormous contribution to uh, defeating Nazism in Europe and uh, and the world uh, during the Second World War. And by the end of the 1940s, because of the changes made in the USSR in the 30s, the Soviet Union developed into a nuclear superpower. But all of this was achieved at an enormous human cost as industrialization in the Soviet Union saw the worst excesses of 19th century industrial capitalism as experienced in Western powers like Britain uh, rolled into one decade. And politically, there was the destruction of the Communist Party through the purges and the terror. So what form did the Soviet's economic reconstruction take? Well, it was based on introducing uh, a planned economy to have a heavy industry industrial base and collective farming now in november 1929 stalin declared that we are advancing full steam ahead to socialism so this uh, propaganda poster highlights the importance of industrialization we have the the uh, huge ship carrying the soviet union forward and uh, throwing to one side the old order Stalin said that we are leaving behind the age old Russian backwardness. The Soviet Union was becoming a country of metal, of automobiles, of tractors. And once the Soviet Union was on an automobile, once the peasant was using a tractor, then he challenged the so-called worthy capitalists, as he called them, who boast of their civilization to overtake the Soviet Union. We shall yet see, he said, which countries may then be classified as backward and which as advanced. So it's in this year, November 1929, that collectivization was launched and we see this expansion of collective farming. Collectivization was an integral part of the Soviet industrialization program, which itself was a fundamental part of reorganizing the Soviet economy as a whole, moving away from the, the moderate market forces and free markets elements of the NEP years of Lenin in the 1920s. And it meant that the government would have control over food production, over its distribution. Uh, it would get food to the workers in the factories. So the Communist Party was committed to industrialization for a number of reasons. Ideologically, it was crucial. It was necessary for building socialism to establish a proletariat who supported the Communist Party. The planned economy itself was favoured. It would end the vagaries of the free market capitalist experiment of NEP in the 20s. Militarily and strategically, industrialization was necessary. It accelerated industrialization. This was necessary to, uh, to counter the threat from what Stalin now saw as hostile capitalist forces. And in terms of socialism versus capitalism, it was economically uh, superior, or seen as being economically superior. It was necessary to prove the superiority of Soviet socialism. So this all, um, so there's a positive attitude that comes within this sections of, from sections of society. We believe what the party is telling them. And at the same time as this sort of economic revolution, there's a cultural revolution which looked to re, uh, reshape the workers and the peasants, uh, to reshape their lives in art, in literature, in music, uh, in technical skills at work. So there's an emphasis now that uh, looked to expand education, to make a more educated working class uh, as the Communist Party wanted to create an intelligentsia of working class origins, to move away from the bourgeois intelligentsia of the 1910s and 1920s uh, and to create a, a proletarian intelligentsia. And this would allow the party to um, end its dependence on 
uh, on bourgeois technical experts. So these new experts would be red experts, would be communist, ideologically sound, proletarian in origin, uh, in their class origin, and specialists. And this massive expansion of education was successful. So there's a huge expansion of an education program. There are huge literary ca literacy campaigns, and it has a profound effect on both the Soviet system and on the lives of workers and peasants. So by 1939, male literacy was up to 90.8% uh, and uh, rising from about 30 to 40% um, just sort of a few decades earlier. And female literacy uh, followed with 72.5% as well. So the party was creating this uh, intelligentsia of, uh, of a working class origin. So there are significant changes at the lower, lower ends of society, and there are improvements that come along with these, uh, with these, these changes from the party. It focus, the party's focusing on society as a whole, not just on the economy. And this was all this huge change was very much in Stalin's mind because he was concerned about the uh, about being overtaken or being crushed by the Western hostile capitalist forces. So he was still worried about this in the early 1930s. And this is when he made his quite a famous declaration. He said the tempo must not be reduced. So he's talking about the speed of change. On the contrary, we must increase it as much as is within our powers and possibilities to slacken the tempo would mean falling behind and those who fall behind get beaten. We refuse to be beaten. We are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. We must make good this distance in 10 years. Either we do it or we shall go under. So there was a recognition here that the Soviet Union was lagging behind, uh, it was comparatively behind Western powers. So Stalin's tasks of business executives in 31 shows some of his concerns and he emphasized it emphasizes his desire for modernization it highlights his reasons for wanting to build a strong country to ensure that the soviet union uh, was secure and to ensure its security that it was secure in any challenges any invasion from these hostile forces so the emphasis here was on speed the tempo must not, re, not, must not be reduced, we must increase it, we must increase the speed of change, the speed of modernity. If it was obvious then that it was about speed, about rapid change, then it was difficult, I think, for the party to be concerned with the human cost. And so the Soviet industrialization was built on a foundation of slave labor and of coercion. And this is where we get the kulaks coming into the into the situation. The kulaks, uh, kulak is the Russian word for fist, or in this term, it means the rich peasant, i.e. the one who controls the money, the tight fist. So the rich peasants, the kulaks, were often herded into, certainly into collective farms, but also if they resisted, they could be uh, the ones who were sent to the prison camps. So in the prison camps, uh, the gulags, as we can see here, this sort of vast um, network of, uh, of slave labor in some ways, but uh, of prison camps known as the gulags, stretching from European uh, Russia, from the European uh, Soviet Union, uh, all the way through uh, through Siberia, Novo uh, uh, Norilsk, or to Yakutsk, to Magadan, uh, all the way down to uh, Vladivostok. So this is an enormous empire, um, and it's an economic empire because slave laborers. Uh, are there, they are found and they are taken and relocated to uh, to work on enormous industrial projects like the White Sea Canal. Um, but it's also part of the means of control for the party, uh, which I'll talk a bit more about uh, a little later. But we have free, uh, we have uh, um, uh, the rich peasants along working alongside the criminal elements, uh, working alongside free workers who had done nothing wrong, but found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time, perhaps because the, the party and the government needed uh, an extra workforce. So these huge changes that take place in agriculture saw the peasants forced onto these collective farms uh, in what was often seen as an attack on the peasantry. And there was great resistance from the peasants. So apart from moving away from this sort of totalitarian model of, uh, of people doing what they're told by uh, a cruel and dictatorial Stalin, 
we actually have uh, either a, some sort of, well support for what the party's doing in, in industry or brave resistance from thousands of peasants uh, who resisted, who rejected what the party wanted them to do uh, and fought against it. So there are struggles between the peasantry and the Communist Party and the totalitarian model of the Soviet, uh, of the Soviet system doesn't allow for that resistance. It only allows for a, a, a kind of a passive um, uh, population. So there are many disagreements between the peasants and the party and the peasants would often slaughter their livestock rather than hand it over to the government. They would gorge on their grain rather than give it to the Communist Party. Some even set fire to their houses rather than hand it over to the state. There are rebellions, there are riots, there are demonstrations, there are strikes against the party's collectivization policy. The, as a, uh, if you're interested in this, the historian Lynn Viola has written extensively on this and uh, she's written some wonderful books on, uh, on the, the peasantry, on collectivization, on the resistance to the party. So there is a sort of a major wave of resistance in the first part of the 1930s. And Stephen Cohen says that Stalin's mass terror began in the years 1929 to 1933 with the ruthless methods he used in the countryside, armed force, often fatal deportations of entire families and widespread famine. So coercion and control was also bound up in the economic reconstruction of the Soviet Union under Stalin. And the most famous example of the famine was uh, occurred in 1932-33. It uh, hit uh, Ukraine, it hit Kazakhstan, it reached into the wider Volga region uh, of, uh, of Russia. And somewhere between five and seven million people died in this famine. They died because of the Soviet Union's actions, the party's actions. Now, there is still much debate today about the nature, about the, the cause of this famine. So uh, historians like Robert Conquest uh, argue that Stalin used famine as a means of breaking the peasantry to end Ukrainian nationalism. And uh, Conquest famously called this a terror famine. So it's a deliberate policy by Stalin to crush the peasantry, to break the backs of the, uh, the peasants in Ukraine, uh, and the sort of the, the wider region, Kazakhstan and into the Volga, uh, and uh, to break Ukrainian nationalism as well. However, the counter argument to that, uh, as put forward by revisionist historians like uh, R. W. Davies, argue that there simply was not enough of the food reserves that was necessary to be able to give to the peasants uh, when it became clear that there was a crisis, that there was a famine. There wasn't enough food because of mistakes that were made in Moscow earlier as part of the wider collectivization process. So instead of being a deliberate policy by Stalin, this was actually a disastrously mismanaged policy that had terrible consequences. That this was human error by politicians in Moscow, not uh, a specifically uh, driven desire to crush the peasants. Now, however we interpret this, the famine was an enormous tragedy. And it was the tragic loss of life in a decade that became characterized by death. So collectivization saw or came with a huge cost of hu in human life. There was increased suffering that was caused to those who survived this mass shift in Soviet ag agriculture. Uh, there was famine, there was uh, death, there was psychological trauma. Uh, and shock. There was the erosion of the traditional Russian rural culture uh, that had existed for hundreds of years. There was uh, the peasants becoming alienated from the regime. There was an attack on, on traditional religion. So we can see how this upheaval in the countryside led to suffering that was, and it characterised collectivization. However, the flip side in terms of industrialization saw uh, various benefits being brought to uh, to citizens lives, particularly in the uh, the industrializing cities. So there's a concentration uh, on production that comes via heavy industry. So there's a shift in heavy uh, in industrialization towards heavy industry of state uh, of, um, of steel production, of coal, of uh, energy, uh, 
to, pro uh, to promote the defense of the, the Soviet Union. But we also see things like the uh, Moscow Metro opening up uh, in, 19, in the mid 1930s. So again, we've got the, a propaganda poster. There is a Metro, uh, long live, the, in the corner there it says, long live our beloved Stalin. Uh, there are no fortresses that the Bolsheviks cannot storm. Uh, and here we have the first test train uh, on the uh, the Moscow underground in, uh, in the mid 30s. There are new modern planned cities that are are beginning to emerge across the Soviet Union. The most famous is probably Magnitogorsk or Magnetic Mountain. So uh, this was built just here in sort of the southern Ural Mountains. Uh, it brings modernity and development to sort of uh, to regions far away from Moscow. This becomes known as the Socialist City of Steel. And it has a population of 250,000 by 1932. And it wasn't just about housing the workers, it's about giving them something more than just work. So there's the metallurgical plants, but there's a cinema, theatre, a circus. It's about trying to develop life away from work, whilst also focusing on the development of the Communist Party and the party's ideals, the political ideals. <coughs> and crucially, at a time when unemployment was uh, so rife in the West because of the, the 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 Great Depression. In the Soviet Union, there was no unemployment. Unemployment had been planned away. So this was a powerful image for many in the 1930s. Uh, in the 1930s, hit Great Depression countries. So the Soviet Union became a beacon of hope and a beacon of, of socialist light uh, for many socialists in the West. They looked to the Soviet Union and said, "That's the kind of model that we want to uh, to follow." obviously not necessarily knowing all of the details of the horrors of what's going on inside. Now, the emphasis was on production inside the Soviet Union and the emphasis was on quantity, not on quality. So what was produced was not always uh, very good. There were low living standards for much of the period. Heavy industry emphasised, uh, heavy industry was emphasised rather than consumer goods. There were some consumer goods, however, uh, and in the mid 1930s, there was an improvement to uh, to citizens lives and an improvement to consumers lives uh, as more consumer goods became uh, available. It was a, a clear conscious policy of, of the party to uh, improve the quality of life for ordinary citizens. So we have things like uh, Soviet champagne, Sovietskoye champagne, uh, chocolate uh, and a perfume becoming more available uh, in the shops. Now, you know, things like champagne, we would associate as being uh, a, a drink of the aristocrats of the upper class uh, in uh, in the West. In the Soviet Union, it becomes a very democratic drink. Uh, it's cheap enough for workers to enjoy. By 1942, there were 12 million bottles being produced. Uh, at one point, it was being sold on tap uh, in food stores next to fruit juice. So there are success stories that come out of this Soviet uh, economic reconstruction. And this creates a groundswell of support for Stalin and for the party from the sort of support from below. So we shouldn't underestimate this support as many people did believe that a new civilization was being uh, established. That the, the suffering that was going on in the West during the Great Depression appeared to confirm the superiority of socialism in the Soviet Union. However, there were also significant um, problems that came with uh, industrialization and with collectivization. So industrialization, there were uh, imbalances within the system. So textiles, chemical industries were failing to advance as they should do. They weren't given the opportunity to grow. The system was difficult, uh, was, uh, difficult to coordinate because of because the orders came from the top down, there was no democratic relationship between what the per the workers and the peasants needed uh, at the ground level and the, what the party wanted them to do in Moscow. And of course, there were these coercive methods and slave labour being utilised as well. There is very little consideration being given to the to the the working conditions uh, in the factories or the fields. So Stalin's revolution from above brought with it a mixed story. It was supported by some, it was resisted by others. And when we consider the resistance to, Soviet, uh, to Stalin, uh, 
we can see that the system came to symbolize the control and coercion that we will now turn to. But there was the it was necessary or it was thought necessary by the party uh, and by Stalin that coercion would be the way to get people to do what they wanted. So the means of control that the party used uh, included propaganda, of course, and there was this cult of Stalin that grew in the 1930s. Uh, it made Stalin into a godlike figure and uh, he was a hero and he re revised um, Russian history to, to tie him to other former or to other old um, uh, strong, powerful leaders, uh, sort of people, uh, sort of uh, Russian, um, strong Russian czars from the past. So people like Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great were, were now seen as Russian heroes. And Stalin was tied to them because they uh, they were seen as obviously cruel leaders, but their decisions, the decisions they had taken were justified because of the constructive ends that uh, that they had served. So they had built a stronger Russia by the end of their rule, even though it had, this Russia had been built by uh, by using harsh, coercive means. And of course, this is exactly the the story we have with Stalin. So officially, every effort was made to prove that the Soviet Union was the best country in the world, that socialism was the best system. And newsreels would lead to would uh, often show happy uh, workers and enthusiastic builders of, of socialism in the factories and the fields, a uh, happy and democratic Soviet Union. Every, as I said earlier, everything good was linked to Stalin. So here we have again a couple of propaganda posters uh, on the the one on the left with the planes. The planes have uh, Soviet leaders' names on: Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin. Uh, and the slogan at the bottom says, long live our happy socialist motherland, long live our beloved great Stalin. And then the other one is of Stalin, this benevolent, kindly father figure, a father of the nation, uh, surrounded by happy children, thanks to our beloved Stalin for our happy childhood. Now, there's, of course, has, there has to be some truth in um, the, the official messages, otherwise propaganda simply can't work. Uh, so there is an element of truth here. And uh, many people knew the kind of system that uh, that they uh, that was being constructed, but where gentle persuasion through propaganda didn't work or couldn't work, there were mass arrests by Stalin's secret police, the NKVD, the, the forerunner of, maybe, of the the KGB that you may have heard of. Uh, so there are the arrest of the NKVD and then being sent to the gulags. So Soviet citizens sent to the gulags were part of this much wider group of uh, Stalin's victims as he had oppositionists uh, inside the party removed during the, the show trials, during the purges and then the wider terror that, uh, that hit society. Now, the background to the uh, this assault on the old Bolsheviks, old Bolsheviks so that is the phrase used for uh, members of the party who were there. Uh, present during the during, either before the revolution or during the revolution. So we had this assault on the old Bolsheviks that begins in uh, with the 17th Party Congress in 1934. And this party congress was known as the Congress of Victors. And it was a key year in the start towards the purges and the terror. The Soviet Union was apparently now on the road to communism. The party took time out to acknowledge the, uh, this great leap forward. Yet Stalin found that there was still dissent within the Communist Party ranks and he believed that his position may be threatened. The problem here for Stalin was the popularity of one particular uh, leading figure and that was the, the Communist Party boss of Leningrad, the Leningrad Party, Sergei Kirov. Kirov was a loyal comrade. He was close to Stalin, but he started to uh, talk about a more cautious approach to collectivization, uh, to uh, to have less peasant exploitation. So he was seen as a slightly gentler um, leader, a gentler uh, communist leader. And he was murdered on the 1st of December 1934. So he wasn't in favour of changing direction completely, but he did favour less hostile policies, especially uh, in the countryside. And many delegates at this Congress of Victors in 1934 agreed with Kirov 
and uh, they began to it, this sort of there was a, uh, a show of support for Kirov, and it looked like Kirov was becoming more and more popular in the party. And it looked like this was uh, a message that was being sent to Stalin, that many Communist Party members were unhappy with the suffering that was accompanied collectivization. And it looked like Kirov's star was on the rise. So this has led some historians like Robert Conquest, one of the sort of leading um, historians who uh, uh, follow this totalitarian interpretation of the Soviet Union. Conquest argued, it's led Conquest to argue that uh, it was necessary for Stalin to eliminate this popular rival to his power. So according to Conquest, the order was given for Kirov's murder. The order came from Stalin himself. And on the 1st of December 1934, a lone gunman, uh, Leonid Nikolaev, one walked into the Smolny Institute in Leningrad, which is where the party had its uh, headquarters, and shot Kirov dead. Now, for conquest, Stalin was to blame, and it's easy to see why uh, Stalin got the blame for this. There's much blood on Stalin's hands. He was willing to, uh, to remove close comrades if necessary. Now, the problem for other historians is that there's no evidence that has ever been found to link Stalin directly to Kirov's murder. There's, you know, we can say, of course, Stalin had him murdered. He was popular. He looked like he could be a challenge to Stalin. Stalin didn't worry about killing people. So therefore, we can add all of these pieces together and come up with this answer. But that's not really good enough for historians. We want that, uh, that crucial piece of paper, that crucial bit of evidence. Uh, perhaps even that crucial smoking gun, if you like. So there were two official Communist Party commissions that were set up under Khrushchev and Gorbachev later on, uh, both uh, leaders who would uh, benefit from being able to link Stalin to Kirov's murder, but there was no link found even in these official commissions. So how do we explain Kirov's death? Well, it could be that it was the NKVD that was to blame. Just as the workers and the peasants had quotas to fulfil, so too did the secret police. They had to ensure that they couldn't be seen as being politically suspect if they weren't fulfilling their um, their quotas. The problem is, what if there weren't well, there wasn't enough real spies uh, or real political opponents to the party to form a danger, a genuine danger to Stalin? Uh, and the Soviet Union. So the, so the the secret police, the NKVD, would have to invent these enemies to ensure that there were these constant threats to the Soviet state, to ensure their own reason to exist. If we accept this view, uh, then it means that Stalin wasn't guilty for Kirov's murder, but his secret police was. Either way, Stalin used Kirov's death to strengthen the NKVD's power and his own position. The day Kirov was murdered, the Politburo passed a new decree. Uh, it was uh, new anti-terrorist uh, laws were given, uh, were giving freedom uh, to uh, to or gave more freedom to the the prosecutors. Um, they were uh, accused; they could accuse uh, the or they the accused no longer had to have uh, defence lawyers, um, and they could question suspects without relying on witnesses, and there was no chance of appeal. So in December 1934, both Stalin and the NKVD became stronger because of this. And they were sort of feeding off one another's insecurities and fears. And this led to the widespread repression in Leningrad, uh, to a clampdown on other alleged anti-Soviet activities. So Leonid Nikolaev himself was tried and shot, and then a further six and a half thousand people were shot, and there were other victims within this clampdown. Old comrades of Stalin's, uh, of Lenin's and Stalin's from the revolution, like Zinoviev and Kamenev, were also arrested and blamed for Kirov's uh, death. Censorship was now tightened as well. And Robert Conquest called this uh, decree of December 1934 a charter for terror. He said, the timing of the decree uh, shows that there was evidence for the, the purges, that the purges were pre-planned, that Kirov was murdered on Stalin's orders. It removed a dangerous rival. It ensured total control over a compliant people through mass repression. However, it is possible that Stalin was genuinely shaken by the murder of a close friend and someone as he saw, saw as a protege, that Stalin genuinely now believed that there were enemies everywhere, 
So the decree was therefore a panicky response by a nervous leadership that there was no predetermined plot for purges. While Stalin took the opportunity to tighten his grip on power, it could be that he had nothing to do directly with the act of murder that killed Kirov. Now, the Kirov affair itself petered out, but only for a short time, and uh, it wasn't long before a new round of purges began. The NKVD needed to continue to remind Stalin of its purpose, and Stalin continued to rely on the NKVD to do so. And it's this dynamic that led to the show trials and the purges within the party. This turned into an assault on, to, on the whole system. Uh, it wasn't simply the Communist Party uh, that was uh, that was hit. It reached into the wider society in the Great Terror of 1937-38. Now, when we look at the, the, the purges and the show trials, the starting point, of course, was before the show trial. It was necessary to accuse uh, the the for the those who are accused of any crimes of the state by the state it was it was necessary to ensure that they would plead guilty there's no point putting on a show trial if it didn't deter others from following the path that was alleged the get the alleged guilty individuals were following so confessions were now obtained through sleep deprivation through torture uh, the, the accused had their families threatened, interrogations would take place at the NKVD's headquarters uh, here in the Lubyanka building in Moscow. Stalin now ordered the NKVD to organise trials of Trotskyites and Zinoviovites. Uh, the Central Committee sent secret letters to regional Communist Party bosses regarding the alleged terrorist activities of what they called a Trotskyite Zinoviovite counter-revolutionary bloc. So we have the start of three show trials of in August 1936, January 1937 and March 1938. And here we have the, 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 the audience who are uh, at the show trials. So in August 1936, Zinoviev, Kamenev and 14 other party officials were targeted. Uh, in January 37, Karl Radek, Grigory Piatikov and Grigory Sikolnikov uh, were hit. And then in March 1938, Nikolai Bukharin, Alexei Rikov and Genyurik Yagada. Uh, and Yagada was the NKVD boss before Yeshov, uh, which reminds us that anyone could be targeted within these show trials. So there's a range of ridiculous charges against party members. They were supposedly part of a Trotskyite counter-revolutionary bloc. They were taking orders from Trotsky. Uh, they were carrying out wrecking uh, activities. They wanted to restore capitalism. They were involved in terrorist activities. All ridiculous chumps up charges. The confessions of those on trial would uh, lead many people to believe the charges against them. All of the accused who took part in this facade were sentenced to death and shot in the back of the head, which was the NKVD's trademark, or they were sentenced to years in prison. And their confessions also implicated other old Bolsheviks, and that led to the second and third show trials. So the Communist Party was now turning in on itself. The NKVD demanded more confessions to ensure the fulfilment of their own quota. The confessions of those who stood trial inevitably implicated others uh, and so on and so on. So ordinary Communist Party workers were now caught up in this mass purging. Hundreds of thousands of communists were purged from the party, especially if they were seen or perceived to be uh, perceived as a threat to Stalin. For ordinary citizens, however, the purges was often seen as something that was happening to the leaders at the top. It had little to do with the rest of society. But then the Great Terror began and it spread throughout the system. It targeted the uh, leading Communist Party officials that uh, can, who were considered unreliable, senior military uh, officers, the Communist Party and state leaders at national rep uh, re uh, Republican level, even as with Yagada, communist uh, NKVD leaders themselves. And then we move into the Great Terror in 1937. So we've had the, the show trials, the purges, the terror. Now it's, it's sort of engulfing the whole, not just system, but the whole country or elements of the whole country. The Politburo wanted to widen its search for counter-revolutionary forces, and it ordered 
the um, uh, the, the shooting of anyone who was found guilty. Stalin sent telegrams to local authorities that were uh, who were deemed to be enemies of the people. They were to be shot without question. Uh, this was a, this order was approved. Uh, uh, Stalin also approved torture as a means of getting confessions. The NKVD's reach then extended far outside of the Communist Party itself, and it had devastating consequences. Hundreds of thousands of people, of communists, of army personnel, of NKVD agents, of uh, ethnic groups were now targeted. And the net was um, was uh, cast further than, than Moscow. This was the start of an attack, a sort of a, a violent attack on other areas of the system. It was an all-embracing policy that was confirmed in November 1937 when Stalin spoke of destroying all sworn enemies of the Soviet Union. Soviet citizens suffered greatly during the terror. Many social, uh, social bonds were broken between people. People were arrested by the NKVD while others would turn against one another as neighbour denounced neighbour, worker denounced corrupt or spiteful Communist Party boss. Some acted this way for ideological reasons. They genuinely believed that there was uh, a threat to, uh, to communism. They genuinely believed that, well, they, these were sort of known as loyal loyalty denunciations. They genuinely believed that uh, the communist cause was being uh, damaged. Some used it as a, a weapon of the weak. Uh, people often had a um, few other ways of fighting back against a system that treated them so harshly. And this gave the, the purges and the terror uh, another dynamic, a force from below. So again, not everything was coming from from the top or being controlled by the top. This was now coming from below. There are reactions uh, that this sort of took on a, a life of its own. And we have the reactions from the leaders in Moscow who now interpreted this as evidence of indeed the enemies that they be, believed were everywhere. At other times, the chaos meant that Moscow was unaware of the arrests that was taking place during the Great Terror. Uh, the further we are away from Moscow, the less likely Moscow would know what's going on. Local Communist Party bosses used Moscow's orders to fulfil their own purposes. So they would settle old scores uh, against local enemies. So definitely not a part of the sort of this loyalty um, uh, affair. Of course, ultimately, Stalin benefited from all of this. It removed rivals, both past and present. Uh, and uh, well, they, they were permanently removed, so they were no longer or could no longer be a threat to Stalin. The Great Terror may not have touched everyone directly or indirectly, despite what traditional historians or histories of, of Stalin's Russia would uh, have suggested. But it was still a deeply dangerous time to be alive in Stalin's Russia. Now, the fear that was felt by many Soviet citizens led to enormous stress, uh, emotional hardship that was experienced by ordinary citizens, uh, ordinary people who are just trying to survive in a rapidly changing world and millions of people were affected in one way or another. So how do we explain the purges and the terror? What are the driving forces of the purges and terror? Well, there are two key schools of thought, the totalitarian school and the revisionists. So for the totalitarian school, people like Conquest, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Stalin was to blame for everything. Everything came via, came through Stalin. Stalin was deeply suspicious. He was an evil genius who was acting competently and with self-control. He removed opposition. He removed anyone who may remember history differently from him, i.e. the old Bolsheviks. This was a conscious and deliberate attempt to ensure total control over the party and the population. The revisionists like J. Arch Getty and Roberta Manning argue that Stalin was important, but he wasn't the sole agent, that the institutional aspects, the institutional factors were also responsible. So they're unconvinced that Stalin organised Kiros murder. The, the focus has to be on the social and institutional factors like the NKVD as well. And the periphery was engaged in arrests and terror that Moscow wasn't necessarily aware of. So the purges take on a life of its own. It creates this dynamic from below. Now, there's still no definitive answer as to how many uh, people died during this, uh, this assault on the system and on the country. 
uh, or indeed how many people were imprisoned, um, partly because we still don't have all the data from the archives. And partly because there's no, uh, it's they're not necessarily included in this. The, those individuals who were um, guilty of of general crimes, not necessarily political crimes, or those uh, who we can't exclude those who were um, who were still free, but then sort of or free workers who were then sent to the gulags as, as sort of innocent victims of Stalin's rule. Estimates at the moment for the peak years of 1937-38 have settled on somewhere between, and as I say, quite vague, but somewhere between 682,000 to one and a half million executions uh, and somewhere between two and 10 million gulag inmates. So a few concluding thoughts. We have genuine support for Stalin and the Communist Party in the 1930s amongst various groups People, many people believed uh, in what the party was doing, uh, in, believed in Stalin, especially when we, uh, when industrialization brought uh, key benefits to individuals and to the country overall. There was indeed a better life for some, although it's important to remember that this could often depend on luck. It could depend on who you were, where you were, uh, whether you were lucky enough to escape the purges and the terror. The Soviet Union restructured its economy to plan away unemployment at a time when there was a, this was a huge problem in the West. It made the Soviet Union strong enough to defeat the Nazis uh, after the invasion of 1941 and to help to defeat fascism during the uh, wider Second World War. And Stalin led an extraordinary transformation of what was a peasant based country, uh, leading it into an urban uh, industrialized great power. And later on, he established the Soviet Union as a nuclear power, one of two nuclear superpowers at the start of the Cold War. So to paraphrase one of Stalin's many biographers, Isaac Deutscher, Stalin found the country with a plough and left it with a nuclear bomb. So there are enormous changes that took place in Stalin's Russia in the 30s. However, coercion and control were central. These were core aspects of the, of the life of the Soviet citizens in the 30s. They were key characteristics of Stalinism. We can question whether the purges and the, the wider attack on the party uh, had to become a wider attack on society. It's possible that the results uh, were the results of the forces from below um, following these sort of denunciations, that they created this, um, this, this dynamic from below rather than just coming from the top down. But we can say that the propaganda, the force that was used, the central coercion uh, from uh, Stalin were central to Stalinism. They were central to Stalin's power. If we remove them, we have something very different that wouldn't be Stalinism. The way that Stalin and the party forced these changes was brutal. It involved repression, uh, extreme force, coercion, exploitation, excessive state power, death and a grotesque um, cult of personality, which turned Stalin into a combination of a sort of a, a, a mafia godfather, a czar and a godlike figure. And he used this power and his position to create a, a powerful system that would become a nuclear superpower after the war. But the human and political cost was extraordinarily high. So I'll leave you with one question that you can either, can either discuss afterwards or you can take away and think about later on. Was Stalin good for the country, but bad for the people? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, that was a fantastic, really useful session and really insightful and great to hear from you. So, you know, I would I would really like to hope that there's going to be some questions from our guests that have joined the session today. So I'll just open up that Q&A. And if you do have any questions at all um, regarding the session that Jonathan has delivered today, or if it is about history at ARU or anything like that, then please do pop that in the chat. So we've got a question already. Thank you so much, Mia. Very quick on the on the mark there. So the question is, Jonathan, why did the party want to improve life for people in cities and make it worse for those in the countryside? Uh, that's an excellent question. Thank you, Mia. Um, I don't know if there was a well, 
there was certainly a desire to make life better in the in the cities because that's where the industrial workers lived. And so if we accept that the party was trying to build this uh, a communist state that was built on um, the ideas of the industrial working class leading the future, uh, then it, the, the party had to improve the lives of the, of the industrial workers in the cities. Uh, they are also the natural or always seen as the, the ones who are the natural supporters of the party. So they're kind of giving back to people they wanted to uh, to earn uh, or to, to ensure the loyalty of. Um, in terms of the life of the, uh, in the countryside, um, there was less concern given to to the peasants, less concern given to, to the agricultural sector, partly again because the party believed in the industrial workers. Uh, but of course, if we're looking at it from a genuinely communist ideal, then the, all, all aspects of the system should have been um, uh, supported, should have been um, seen their lives improve. But if we accept sort of the kind of the, I suppose, the more aggressive or totalitarian view of the uh, of, of Soviet or Stalinist history, then we can say that this was a conscious decision by Stalin to uh, to break the peasant resistance because there again there's a, that push towards collectivization, uh, which was again leaving behind the the market forces of the 1920s the individual capitalists or nep men as they were known the sort of the, the market those who who um, benefited from the market forces being reintroduced in the 1920s. There's now a desire to break with that in the 1930s by Stalin, uh, and the, the the peasants were always seen um, viewed with suspicion by Stalin. So it's either a, a conscious decision to break the resistance of the peasants, uh, a res to break the backs of the peasantry and, and make a more compliant um, population, and bearing in mind, you know, the, the the agrarian population is still the majority of people in uh, in the in the Soviet Union at this point, uh, or it's just uh, a lack of care, a lack of concern. They were more concerned with the industrial workers because that's those are the workers they had to uh, secure the loyalty of, uh, and they just didn't care about the peasantry. So it's a, again that's a slightly complicated answer, but it's based in the historiography of how you see uh, the Soviet Union and sort of which school you fit into, the totalitarianists or the the revisionists. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Jonathan. I hope that's useful for you, Mia, as well. So thank you very much for your question. Um, and we've got a few more minutes. I think we've got approximately four minutes left for the session. So if there are any other questions, please do pop them in the chat. I know that we do have some typing. So we've got another question here. What were they doing in the prison camps and how long were people in them for? Uh, it's an excellent question, given that the gulags were a, a central part of uh, the, the system. Um, so in the prison camps, the prison camp, we should firstly point out that the, the gulags were different to the Nazi concentration camp, or particularly the Nazi death camp. So the, the purpose of a gulag was not to kill the, uh, the, the the citizens or kill the inmates. Um, it was sort of rehabilitation. You know, if they if they were genuinely seen as uh, um, not educated in the in the communist ways that Stalin believed in or Stalin wanted to to uh, put forward, uh, then there would be um, re-education programs. But they were often used as slave labour. So one argument that comes through the historic historiography of Stalin's Russia is that because of the huge economic reconstruction that takes place more workers were needed for um, for huge projects uh, like, for example, the White Sea Canal construction. And so rather than concentrating on or worrying about paying workers good wages uh, and enforce and ensuring good working conditions, which of course you would expect in a socialist society, you have this vast slave labour pool that you can go to the gulags for and find you know all these workers and ship them out to different parts of the system uh, to all or indeed to the salt mines uh, and to produce for um, for the system so life in this in the the prisons were, um, were were harsh intolerable and many people did die um, but the the sort of 
that again that was through a lack of concern for the inmates rather than a, uh, a specific aim so they weren't death camps they were labor camps how long were they in there for well that would depend on uh, on the crimes they had committed on the sentences they were given so it could be five years or ten years hard labor some people were in there for sort of sent in there for 20 years um, and there was often an expectation in uh, um, in the party in, in Moscow that these people would not be seen again and this became um, quite a shock when a lot of these people were freed after Stalin's death so Khrushchev freed these uh, um, uh, gulag inmates so sort of three or four million who were freed in the 50s uh, and there are uh, stories um, of how gulag inmates would often or would occasionally bump into the the person who had sent them there and the look of surprise and shock and horror on their face uh was uh was often quite extraordinary again so i hope that answers your question thank you jonathan um we've got another question here so i was wondering about stalin's politics outside of russia for example south america or sub sub-saharan africa for example and how they installed them wow that's a fantastic question um so i think that when we're looking at i mean they're quite different uh, regions to look at so as i said in the the the, the talk stalin's russia or soviet union becomes a beacon of hope for many people in the 1930s especially as uh capitalism looked like it was collapsing um but so Stalinist um, communist parties were uh, had their were linked or the communist parties around the world were linked to to Moscow had funding and backing from Moscow and, and leaders in these countries maybe or in regions in sub-Saharan Africa or in, in South America would often go to Moscow as part of a wider kind of internationalist brotherhood of communists and they would be trained uh, in Moscow they would uh, develop their links they would be taught how to do things then they would take these techniques back to to their countries um, or the uh, just again in sort of naturally people in communist parties in South Africa sort of South America for example would read the um, the books of Lenin and of, uh, uh, of Marx and Engels and of, of the sort of how to go about leading a revolution, and they would again then uh, follow the model of uh, of the Russian Revolution in 1917 and follow the model of Soviet development, and that of course was uh, Stalinist development in the, in the 1930s. And the same thing happened in China as well after 1949. So China becomes a sort of a Stalinist model in China. So there are a number of reasons or a number of ways in which. Uh, uh, international communist parties would would uh, would lead their um, uh, lead their revolutions and install their power. Thank you, Jonathan. We've had some really good questions there to finish that session, which is really, really, um, really useful. And it's really great when we do have questions coming through from these sessions. So thank you very much um, to our guests today for that. Um, and we are sort of at the close of the session today and um, so first and foremost a big thank you to you Jonathan for delivering the session today and for you know for supporting the the, the Q&A that we've had at the end there and also to our attendees that have attended the session today um, as I said at the beginning I am going to post in the chat just now um, a short feedback form um, and it would be great if you could just spend a moment or two filling this in for us it's really useful for us to have your feedback um, because it does allow us to inform the planning for future events and allows us to sort of analyse, you know, what went well with these sessions and, and perhaps things that we can do differently next time. So if you did have a moment, we would really appreciate you filling that in for us. So, yeah, thank you so much, Jonathan. I really appreciate no your time today. And to our guests, thank you for joining and perhaps we'll see you in some of the sessions later on this week. Thanks, Laura.